All right. Well, we are live again on our um, Facebook Live, doing our live streaming. Once again, it is a pleasure and a blessing to uh, to be with you all on this day. We are grateful to God for the, uh, the opportunity for life that he has uh, chosen to grant us. He has uh, proven to us again and again that he is God and he is worthy of all glory, all honor. And, uh, and all of the praise, and so we are here today to, uh, to celebrate that reality. It is our way again of, of letting, letting God know that we are grateful uh, to him for just another day that he has chosen to grant us, knowing that we're not deserving. Knowing again that we... Uh, don't deserve his greatness and his goodness that he is uh, bestowing upon us, but he's allowing us again just the privilege of, uh, of life together as we are on this day. Uh, please excuse my hesitation. I'm trying to use these, uh, these new gadgets, if you will, uh, just to kind of help us to enhance some things that we're doing as a church. And so uh, today we're trying to do some things as far as recording. Uh, what we're doing as far as the uh, the service is concerned. So please bear with me for just a moment. Um, as always, any time that we do this particular time together on a Wednesday morning, it is a time that we are uh, interceding on behalf of our brothers and sisters, uh, praying for those who are, are going through seasons of difficulty and um, disease and sickness and illness. And I want to do this right now to offer uh, an apology to, uh, to Sister uh, Helen Freeman, definitely to Sister Helen Marie Freeman. On last Sunday, I failed to uh, announce to our church uh, that her younger sister had, uh, had died uh, on last week. And uh, I do apologize, Sister Freeman, for that. To Rogers, uh, I'm sorry for that. As a matter of fact, I thought about it uh, Sunday night, sun Monday morning. It was on my mind again, but I thought this would be the time that we could do that. We certainly would be praying for her and her family, um, kind of a... Um, a thing almost caught the family by surprise to some degree. And so we certainly want to be praying for them. Nothing COVID-19 related. Uh, sister was sick. She was ill. And uh, she did die on last week. And so we want to pray for Helen and for her family. So would you bow with me for just a moment as we go to God in prayer and uh, trusting God always again for him to open the door and for him to, uh, to make the way. Father, we do love you and thank you again for being the awesome God that you are, for being the gracious God that you are for allowing us the privilege of knowing you. Uh, God, there are so many people, uh, whether they be um, uh, in religious order, whether they be in politics, whether they be in entertainment, um, some people are in business. There are so many people that we know of, we know about, uh, but they have no clue that we exist. But God, we are grateful that the God of the universe, the God who knows the number of hairs that are on our head, the God who knows when a sparrow falls to the ground, you are intimately concerned about the details of our life. And for that, God, we are grateful. For that, God, we are humbled. Uh, for, God, for that reason, God, we revere you. We, we regard you uh, because we know you are our Father who is in heaven and your name is to be hallowed. Uh, we do revere that name. We do give the highest respect to that name. Uh, and so we're very, very thankful for you. And we, are, we recognize that our hope is always that your kingdom will come and that your will will be done on earth as it is done in heaven, God. And we clearly know that right now you are showing us that your will is being done and your, your kingdom uh, overall is being established in and through us. And God, we pray that, that the establishment of that kingdom would start personally in me and for all other believers, God, who have put our faith and our trust and our confidence in you. Uh, through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we are here this morning, uh, we rush always to ask that you would forgive us of our sins, knowing that there are things that we should have done, didn't do things we should have left undone that we did. And so, God, we are, we are trusting again in your forgiveness. We put our confidence in you, our faith in you, our hope in you. And so, again, thank you for just this uh, great privilege of life that you're granting us. And so here we are here this morning. Uh, here together again as believers in Jesus Christ uh, from far and near. We're from the south and the east, the north, the west, uh, all over this city and even beyond. And uh, so, Lord, we want to lift up before you Sister Helen Freeman, uh, Sister Helen Marie Freeman and her family. Uh, 
sister uh, that died uh, on last week, God, we would lift that family up before you and pray again your grace and your mercy would be in their lives. God, uh, just had another sister that died last month and then another uh, a month later. So, God, we ask in Jesus' name uh, that you would just give peace as only you can, give comfort uh, as only you are able, help them to do pray for hope and the rest of her family. Those caregivers, Lord, who are showing their concern for their loved ones who are getting older, uh, as we talked about on last Sunday, uh, that she is not in any way despising them because they're getting older, but she is not neglecting them, but putting herself in a way to be of service to her dad, to be of service to her aunts. And, uh, and I just pray again, your grace and your mercy be on that, uh, upon that family, Father. Uh, we do pray again for our own sister Almira Ellison. We know her condition, her situation, her circumstance, but at the end of the day, she is still praising you, still loving you, still thanking you again for being the awesome God that you are. So we pray for her, uh, and we ask again you continue to keep her in your perfect peace with her mind always stayed on you. For Betty Savannah, for Carol and Ben, uh, the nursing home issues that they're still dealing with, what their loved ones are having to deal with, can only see them through glass, can only see them by way of video, um, but can't touch them. And so, God, we pray uh, that you would continue just to protect the family, protect uh, the mothers, uh, protect, again, this wife, uh, Carolyn, and we just ask, again, your mercy and your grace be there for Horace, who sees about his wife, for Greta, who sees about her mom, for Marvin, who sees about his sister. I ask God again, your grace and your mercy will continue to be in that life. For all of us, God, for all of our family members that are going through, some just getting older, life is getting more difficult. But God, we thank you uh, for knowing that they're still growing older in your grace and in your mercy. And so we pray again all over the world. We know what's happening with the coronavirus and things of that nature. We know that our countries, our states, our cities are opening up again. And so as always, just at the beginning, as we did in March, even right now, we're in May. We're still praying, God, that you would continue to protect us. And you've proven that. And we thank you so much for that. So we're not going to complain about what we don't have, but we're going to praise you for what we do have because what we have is so much greater than what we think we don't have. So we thank you, God, uh, for your provision. We thank you again for your power. We thank you for your peace that surpasses all understanding, that it will continue to guard our hearts and our minds through Christ Jesus our, our Lord. And so again, for anyone that I failed to pray for, Lord, I know you know every detail about every situation of their life. So our prayer concerns uh, for those who are sick and homebound, and even for those, uh, those that we intercede for as for as family and friends, uh, everybody else in between, we thank you again for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for Sister Phil. We thank you for the baby again in, in, in Tanisha's belly. We just ask again you continue to keep as only you can. Help us again to know that you are God and beside you there really is no other. To you, Lord, we give all the honor, the glory, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, it is a privilege to, uh, to be with you all. Uh, Good Shepherd, you do know we, we're, we're, we're reading through the other uh, book of Proverbs. So today is what, the 13th day. Uh, so we've got 31 Proverbs for us to read. We started at chapter 1. Uh, we're going all the way to chapter 31 at the end of this particular month. And right now, we're focusing on chapter 13 of the, of the book of Proverbs, focusing on chapter 13 uh, of the book of Proverbs. I told uh, Marcy the other day, so I'm excited about uh, the approach that God has allowed me to take because there's so many uh, books of the Bible that I hadn't studied in a long time uh, in, its, in its fullest sense. Uh, but having this, having this opportunity to study the Proverbs has truly been a blessing. And today, we're going to focus on chapter 13 because what we're finding in chapter 13 or what God is doing, God is revealing to us uh, through who Solomon, who was the richest man, the wisest man, and the most well-known man in the world. And God allows him to have wisdom that is beyond that of any human being that has ever lived. And, and God uses Solomon just to write down. You know how sometimes uh, we, we've got sayings that we have, uh, things that we, you know, that some, some stuff is real, some, some things are in the Bible, other things are not in the Bible. Uh, you know, things like, you know, if you make one step, you'll make two. Little sayings like that, you know, six and stones, six and stones will break my bones, but words uh, will never hurt me. Uh, you know, got little sayings like, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. 
Um, um, we say things, uh, hear it in funerals. Um, Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. Uh, most of the things I just said, can't find them in the Bible, but those are little sayings that we make up. But when you think about those sayings, they are always great narratives. They are always major stories attached to those sayings. Those sayings are very small, very brief, but we remember them. And notice what we do. We apply that little saying to a big, big story. Sometimes it's just a, a life story uh, that we hear about somebody, and we just apply those little bitty sayings uh, to, uh, to, to, to whatever that, that, that single event may be. And it's the same thing that Solomon does, for the most part, in these Proverbs that we're reading right now. He makes short, what we call pithy statements. Uh, these are general rules for life, uh, but we understand that is not always a guarantee um, uh, that is going to always be there in every moment. But what we do know ultimately that the things that God is saying in his word for us is ultimately going to work out. That's what we do know. Uh, Romans chapter 8 says what he causes all things to work together what for our good for those of us who love him and for those of us who are called according to his purpose. So what we're going to do today, <coughs> some of you have the handout already. Uh, for those of you that don't have the handout, I do apologize and I will make sure. I got to find out a different way if we're going to continue to do this to make sure that you can get these things ahead of time. Um, uh, so I guess I'm going to have to do some things a little bit more in advance in making sure that you get uh, copies of it. But I would that you would listen carefully as we go through it. So today, what we're going to do is, um, uh, is look at the Proverbs of Solomon, and I'm reading from the handout right now. Uh, they identified, instructed, transformed, and confirmed human character. They sovereignly identified humanity as righteous or wicked. They righteously instructed humanity in God's law. They graciously transform humanity through obedience. And then they finally, they justifiably confirm humanity's sinful state. Because this is what these Proverbs prove. Uh, because what it's showing us is that God views humanity from two perspectives. Either we're righteous or we're wicked. That's, that's it. There's nothing in between. Uh, he would remind us in Genesis chapter 6 that when he made man, he says, every intent of man is evil continually. Later on in chapter, chapter 8, uh, after the flood is over, after Adam now is getting ready to, he has established the new covenant with, I'm sorry, with Noah and his sons. He says, I'm never going to destroy a man from the face of the earth again, although I know every intent of man is evil continually. That's what God says about us. However, because of uh, Romans 12 says because of man, Romans 5, verse 12, because of Adam's sin, all men sin, and as a result, all men die. However, when we start reading the, pre, the, 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 the next verses, he reminds us that now we, are, we can take on a new life, but that new life comes what, through the person of Jesus Christ. And so uh, if any man be in Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he what, becomes a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, behold, all things become new. And what do we attain? We attain what the righteousness of God. He reminds us that in Romans chapter 4, uh, Abraham believed God and what it was accounted to him as righteous. And so we take on what the righteousness of God and we take on that righteousness what, through the example that has been left to us through his son, Jesus Christ. So now, in this study today, we will evaluate our own character by honestly answering the questions that follow these 25 proverbs. Later, have a relative or companion answer the same questions about you. I want you to answer the questions about yourself initially. Circle it, check it, underline it, however you choose to do it. But then later on, let your relative or a companion who knows you well answer those same questions about you. And if you choose to compare, Pay attention to whether or not you view yourself the same way they see you. You know, because for, for all intents and purposes, for most of us, most of us feel like we're doing pretty good. And uh, sometimes when you allow our, we allow ourselves to be evaluated from the viewpoint of another, we find out 
that sometimes we may not be doing as well as we could. And we say this, what? There's always room for improvement in certain areas of our life, right? And so notice, and, and the first thing that, that that says to us is that if somebody were, if you, 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 when you do these questions and you answer them for yourself, and if your relative, your companion has a different one than you, don't get angry, don't get upset, pay attention to what they're saying. Because the first thing that Solomon says in chapter 13 at verse number 1, he says, A wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. So remember, the key thing is that Solomon is continuing to teach is that as the wisest man that God at that time, that God had placed on the planet, as the wealthiest man, as the most well-known man, he writes these proverbs as means of instructions, primarily what for his son, for younger men that he is mentoring, that he is discipling, that he is teaching, and he, he has the grid of the Mosaic law that God had given him uh, because according to uh, Deuteronomy 17, because he was king, he had to have a copy of the law, and now the goal was for him to know that law and then for him to teach those whom God had given him rule over to always remind them of what God had said in his law. The Ten Commandments, the 613 uh, judgments, statutes, commandments, laws, testimonies uh, that God had given to the nation of Israel. But what he does is that he conciles those 613 laws, the Ten Commandments, he conciles them and he gives short statements about them in order that the people of that day, and watch this, even you and I can know how we're to live in this particular time. So when he says, he, wise, a wise son, this is again, one who is going to live life skillfully, one who's going to live, watch this, a godly life skillfully, not according to one's own ways, not according to what, how I think it ought to be, but according to what God said. So here is the first question that I'm asking about myself. Am I teachable? Or am I te temperamental? And what I mean by temperamental, I, I mean, am I arrogant? Am I know-it-all? Am I one of those friends you can't tell anything? Or am I teachable? Am I willing to listen? When somebody, when somebody will bring something to my attention, am I willing to listen, to be teachable as to what they, uh, they have to say? You know, I say this about one of, one of my great friends. When people, some, I got some pastors who ask me sometimes, uh, there's, a, there's a minister here in our church, and they ask me, how's he doing? And I say, man, you know what? He's teachable, meaning that he's willing to learn. He's willing to listen. Uh, he's willing to be observer, that even though there's some trials and that test that come, but, but hangs in according to the word of God. The question is, though, about you. Are you, are you teachable or are you temperamental? Are you one of them? Hey, look, I got it. Do you have a, I, I don't need nobody to tell me nothing. Uh, I, you, you, can nobody teach me anything? Is that, is that, is that, is that. So a wise son, he's his father's instruction. But notice the contrast. Because what is he dealing with? First of all, the righteous or the wicked. And in some Proverbs, he starts with the wicked. Then he goes to the righteous because the word but there is always a contrast to what has been previously said. Correct. So notice again what he says in verse two, a man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the unfaithful feeds on violence. Uh, here's the question. Uh, is the way I speak helpful or hurtful? In other words, when I speak, am I speaking in ways that edify, that build up a person? Or do I speak in a way that actually puts down a person? You know, Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 actually says, out of the abundance of the heart, whatever's in the heart of my mind, that's what's going to come out of my mouth. Yeah, 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 folks. I know sometimes we say, you know, I didn't mean to say that. You know, you're lying. That's just the truth. It's just, that's, a, that's just, we mean to say what we say. And whatever is really in us, that's what's going to come out of us. One of the things I'm learning right now, it is so important to learn to how to speak kindly and, 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 and let your, your speech be seasoned with salt, as the scripture would remind us, uh, now when you're young. Because when you get old, man, if you don't have no filter, you say anything. You just say anything. And here's, what's, here's the awful reality. When people get older, 
we excuse them because we say they just owe. But at the end of the day, if they are not speaking in a way that pleases God, they wrong. Now, it's difficult sometimes to tell the old, the elderly folk they wrong, but the reality is, the reality is, it's wrong, you know. So learn to be kind. Learn to speak uh, in, a, in a way that helps people and not hurt people uh, early on in life. He says it in verse 3. He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Here's the question. Am I conscious about what I say or... I could care less about the chaos it causes. Do I think about what I'm getting ready to say? You know, do I, do I, I think, I think, uh, 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 I think Reverend Wilson used to say it that way. Uh, at some time before you say anything, and I'm not sure, I heard some old people say this, I'm not sure how you do that, that you twist your tongue in your mouth seven times. Well, maybe you can, you know. In other words, do that, hesitate, pause, think about, what I'm getting ready to say, watch this, think about how I'm getting ready to say something before I, before I say it because I need to care about what I am saying. And you know, one of the things I've learned, you know, one of the things I've learned, people who have a tendency not to care about how they talk, man, you can hurt their feelings just like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's, that's one of the most amazing things to me. It's like they don't care what they say, but the moment you say something to them that appears to be correcting them, oh, they all, they all upset. And they will say, look at you, you got an attitude. Look at you too, you know, all of that kind of thing. So, so it's important to keep in mind that I need to be conscious about what I'm saying. Colossians chapter 4 would remind us. He says, uh, he says let your speech always be with grace. Wow, always be with grace. That's a pretty cool word. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you know how to respond properly to the various issues of life. Because understand, everybody don't have the same feelings you have. Everybody don't look at things the same way. So God is saying to us that if we're going to live life skillfully, if we're going to live life as a wise guy, as a wise um, a, a woman, as a wise man, as a wise girl, if I'm going to live life skillfully, it must be in accordance with obe obedience to God. And I got to watch how I talk. Verse 4, he says, the soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. Here's his question. Am I it internally lazy with nothing to show for it or intentionally working to have something? Woo. <laughs> Am I? You know, it, yeah, I mean, there's some folk who possibly, you know, since this coronavirus thing's been going on, you know, who who not working, you know, because they can't go to work, are sitting around thinking, man, I hope I don't ever have to go to work. You know, oh, that's just not, that's not the right view. That's just not how God, because when, when laziness is there, when I, when I don't want to do anything, when I just try not to do anything, I'm not going to have anything to show for it. There's not going to be anything productive in the run of a day, in the run of a week, in the run of a month, the run of a year, uh, in the multitude of years, in the run of a life. I have nothing to show for the fact, other than the fact I'm just lazy. I want to do nothing. I'm, I'm a slugger. Amen. Amen. If you, don't, if you don't move me, I'll stay right where I am. But, but what he is saying, am I a person, in other words, who is intentionally working to have something? And when I say stuff, something, I'm not talking about just stuff. But do at the end of the day, can I look at the end of my day and say, you know, I accomplished something today. Thank God for his grace. God woke me up this morning gave me my health and strength. What am I doing with this life that God has given me? What am I doing with the resources that God has provided for me? Uh, can you remind us, second, remember second, second Thessalonians, I think in chapter 3, he says, you know, Paul says, we told you when we were among you that if a person don't work, neither should they eat. Ooh, I know somebody upset right now, but that's just the reality. If somebody, and I'm talking about not not with the incapacity to work, not having a disability where you can't work. I'm talking about able body can work, but just lazy, don't want to work. The Bible says, oh, call me self-skinner. The Bible says, 
<laughs> if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Because I don't know if that encourages somebody today, you know, just don't feed that joke. Just tell them they can't eat here. They don't want to work, you know. Well, again, that's another story altogether. Look at chapter 5. A righteous man hates lying, but a wicked man is loathsome to come to shame. Here's the question. Do I, do I despise lying or am I indifferent about it? Can I be in the presence of a person who, who can be lying on somebody else? And I know they lying on a person. What I, or what they even say about themselves, I know they lying. Do I tolerate that person lying or do I say to that person, hey, man, you know, this is not true what you're saying. Am I indifferent toward about it? Do I say, oh, well, you know, hey, that's just who I, that's how they are. So I don't worry about it. I'll get trouble about it. Um, um, uh, that's an indication something uh, of something about me. That's what the, this, 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 this proverb is teaching, that if I can just, you know, tolerate and allow somebody to just constantly be in my presence and lie, and I never say anything about it, it's an indication of my attitude. First of all, what it really says, I don't really, yeah, uh, 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 yeah, Cain, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am. I need to be concerned about that individual. So I have to ask myself, uh, do I despise a person who lies, or do I despise lying? Not the person, do I despise lying, or am I indifferent about it? Uh, verse 6, it says, righteous, the righteous, righteousness guards him whose way is blameless, but the wickedness overthrows the sinner. Am I, am I more considerate of God's word or my own will? Yeah, uh, in other words, righteousness, the righteousness of God, he says, it guards us from getting in trouble. It guards us from putting ourselves in difficult situations. Gu he guards us, uh, protects us again from destruction, if you would. Matter of fact, he even uses the word, the way, of, that, the way it, that is blameless. Again, the righteous guards him whose way is blameless. And when he says blameless, this is a person who, or this is a believer, who is choosing to live that life in such a way that you can't always point the finger. Listen, do we have moments and minutes of life, yeah, that people can say, hey, man, you did such and such and so so, and they tell him the truth. But it should not be a situation every day that person is, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I can be blamed for it. I, they're actually pointing out something that I'm doing consistently, habitually, every day. And I got people around me who are saying, hey, Lee, hey, man, you need to correct that. You need to get rid of that. You need to stop that. Uh, Lee, you need to do something different than what you've been doing. But I do it all the time, and I find myself I'm not. But, but what he says, righteousness, and how do I attain that righteousness? I attain that righteousness, first of all, through the Holy Spirit, the Christ who lives in me. But I attain that righteousness by hearing the word of God. And here's the greater thing. By putting what I hear into practice. If God, if I say that what God has said is right, now I need to put it into practice practice or or am I one of the ones who say look I'm gonna do me I don't care what nobody think that's just the way I am I ain't gotta change that's the way I was when you met me this the way I'm gonna be when I die uh is that the attitude so uh, I got to be more considerate am I more considerate of God's word or my own will uh, verse 7 he says there is one who makes himself rich it has nothing one who makes himself poor yet has great riches that's a that's a pretender that's a pretender. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, uh, this, uh, this kind of a drama show that was on yes, many years ago. And it was actually called Pretenders. A guy named Jared, Jared. He could literally take on any kind of character that he wanted to take on. That dude was a, you know, based upon the show, he was a genius. He could be a doctor. He could be a race car driver. I mean, just, just a total genius. He could just change and become whatever he wanted to become. The question about us is this. Am I for real or do I fake? In other words, notice again what he's saying. That's one who makes himself rich, yet has nothing. This is a person you can you know, kind of dress up a certain kind of way and, you know, look a certain kind of way, but, but in reality don't really have the means uh, to live the way they live and to dress the way they dress, and, but they make the appearance that they got it going on more than what they do. There are some people on the other hand who got it, could be rich, could have the resources, but they act like they're poor so that nobody's going to ask them for it. So, but the question becomes now, am I a pretender? In other words, what you see is what you get. Am I the same person publicly that I am privately? 
Am I the same person uh, based on my character that I am as it relates to my reputation? You know, reputation is what I want people to know about me. Character is really who I am. So what he's saying, the psalm, I mean, what the, the proverb is, 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 is showing us, uh, are we going to be pretending? <laughs> are, are we just going to be who we truly are and always trust God that the best of us is the, is the most real of us? So he says, he asked to, I'm just asking the question, am I for real or do I fake it? Number, number, number eight, uh, a ransom of a man's life is his riches, but the poor does, does not hear rebuke. Uh, here's the question, am I controlled by possessions or carefree about them? A, ma- a ransom of a man's life, in other words, um, uh, a man is willing to give up stuff because his life is so built on what he has on the stuff that he possesses? Or do I, do I hold on to things lightly? Yeah, am, am I living a life where I'm, you know, I'm more concerned about my car, my cash, my commodities, you know, um, you know the, the ring I got, the, you know, the clothes I wear, whatever. Am I more concerned about that? Or, or am I, am, do I hold those things lightly? Do I hold them, do I hold them, them loosely, you know, you know, uh, let's talk about that some years ago, and I, I think it still happens every now and then, but I, uh, my wife and I, we made, Marsh and I made a decision a long time ago, I, I, you come to my house, you can sit where anywhere in my house, we, we, we want, it's okay, you can sit, it, because there's nothing, nothing at all uh, about that house that's more important than us than the people in the house. Can I get somebody to help me here? I'm not saying that we're just going to be filthy and nasty. And dirt. No, that's not what I'm suggesting at all. But I am saying that, it, that, that, that if, if I come out of my yard, I want y'all to listen to what I'm saying. If I come out of my yard and having cut that yard, clean up that yard, and I myself decide that I'm just going to sit in the living room on light-colored furniture, I got the right to do that if I choose because the stuff is not more important than me. Yeah, uh, I think the other day, the other day, I uh, went to a place and <laughs> we were getting some, as a matter of fact, it was for Saturday, it was for Saturday. We get in some, uh, get some water uh, for the event on Saturday. And so the guys, they had, a, you know, had put it on a pallet, came up to my truck, you know, kind of looking at my truck, he say, he said, man, you going to put this pallet back here? I say, yeah. He say, he say, oh man. He say, he say, I got a, I got a brother who won't put nothing on the back of his truck. I told him, I say, man, you gotta be joking with me, cause it is no way that that truck is more important than me. Oh Lord, I'm paying for that truck. In other words, that truck would have still been at the dealership if I didn't pay for it. So, so I'm not, never ever put possessions more important than people. Can I get somebody to help me here? Verse, eight, verse 9. It says, the light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. When you look at life, are you glad or are you gloomy about life? You're a believer. You are a follower of Jesus Christ. You have been saved by the blood of Jesus. All of your sins of past, present, and future have been forgiven. You have been redeemed redeemed from the slave market of sin. There has been propitiation. You, Jesus Christ has now satisfied the wrath of God against you, and you are no longer an enemy of God. You are a child of God. But when you look at life, y'all know where I'm going. Members of the church, y'all know where I'm going. Do you live life like hee-haw? You know, hey, Lee, how you doing? Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Lee, how you feeling? Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. Lee, how should If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Come on, Lee, just tell me really how everything is going. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. No, 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 no. What he's saying, how do you view life? Do you view life from a perspective of gloomliness? Or are you glad about life? Even in the midst of what we're experiencing right now, do you look at just the gloominess of life? Or do you look at how, what you got to be glad for? That's the thing that what he said, the righteous or the wicked. Many, we, we, if, if there's wickedness that's there, if there's evil that's there, I'm going to always look for the bad stuff. I'm going to always look for it. Listen, 
We have been talking about this pandemic since the, since the middle of March, right? And there's still some folk who are complaining about this, that, and the others going on. But think about it. You're still here. Just the mere fact you here ought to say it gives evidence that God is a great God, that God is an awesome God, that God still provides. Yes, have we had to cry in the midst of this to see people that have died because of absolutely. That has been, that's, that's been really tough because of the virus. Uh, the whole way that we do in funerals now are different. So that's, does that hurt us? Yeah, it does. But what God wants us to do is not to look at life from a gloomy perspective. In other words, there's a dark cloud hanging over us all the time. He wants us to be glad and rejoice. What we say, today, this is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. And when we say that, we're not saying that from the standpoint that, that everything in the day is cool, that everything in the day, that some things that hadn't made me sad, that things that I haven't grieved about today. But overall, I can say it's a good day. Why? God made it. God is in control of it. God got everything in his power. God got everything in the palm of his hand. So do I look at life from a gloominess, from gloominess, or do I, am I a person who's glad about the things of life? Verse 10, by pride comes nothing but strife, but with the well-advised is wisdom. Am I settled in my own opinion, or do I seek the advice of others? Am I one of those persons who say, look, I don't need nobody to tell me that. I got this. Look, this is the way I see it. And this is the way it ought to be. Or the, am I a person who will look at to someone else and say, you know, look at someone, old, an older person and say, you know, man, I, I pretty much appreciate, you know, I watched this cat riding the bin. It turns out how he handles stuff. Do I, let me go talk to Rodney. Let me find out how he does this, how he makes this happen all of his life. Uh, I look at a particular lady, you know, I, I, I really enjoy seeing how she's done with her children and can I go talk? Let me, let me talk to her. Or, or do I say, hey, look, I don't need nobody telling me what to do. I already got this, um, um, you know, my way or the highway and not considering that there's the possibility of another way. Um, yeah. Um, verse 11, wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished. But he who gathers by labor will increase. Watch this. Am I into anything for money? Or investing advisably. How do I do it? Am I anything? Rich, quick, squeam, scheme, no matter what it is. You know, pyramid, man, you just lead me to the next one. I just want to just do it any kind of way I can. I got, my, I got to lie, I got to cheat, if I got to hold back some of the truth, whatever it's going to take, I'm just trying to get this money. Or do I, do I, do I, do I use money and invest it wisely and, ad, and advisedly? And I know what somebody say, hey, man, you know, when you, sometimes when you use them, when you do it advisedly and you're doing proper investments, guess what? Hey, man, stock market will go down and you lose a bunch of money. But here is the thing you trust. You're doing it the right way. You're doing it the honest way. Trust God that God has the way of causing it to increase. Let that money stay in there. Let it work for you. Let it do what it needs to do. Because it's going to come back up at some point. And even if the stock market doesn't change, you got to believe that there's a God who is so concerned about you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to make sure that the means to the end is met. He's going to make sure that, that whatever is necessary to get you where you need to be is going to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm moving, try to get through all of these 25 of a kid. I don't know if we will, though. Verse 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when desire comes, it is a tree of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when desires come, it is a tree of life. Am I more, watch this, am I discouraged and quit when hope is delayed or determined to continue? When things don't happen the way I think it ought to happen, things are happening right now, things aren't going the way I think it ought to go right now, do I quit, throw in the towel, say, oh, man, it's not even worth it, or... Am I determined to continue trusting God to see how he's going to work it out? That's, that's what I got to decide. That if, I, if it's a demonstration again of, of, of wickedness, it can show because when I become discouraged and I quit, it becomes an issue of what James talked about. Faith without, without works is what? It's dead. Work without faith is dead. So when I quit, I'm throwing in the towel. I'm no longer demonstrating faith and trust in God, but when I continue, 
even though it's difficult sometimes, even though I got to cry, even though I go through it with a limp, even though I got to go through it with cancer in my body, even though I got to go through it with, with, with heart problems, even if I got to go through whatever the situation may be, however I've got to go through it, I've got to make the determination that even though things are not happening the way I think it ought to be happening right now, I'm going to trust God that he wakes me up in the morning and he's going to make a way. 13, he who despises the word will be destroyed, but he who fears the command uh, will be rewarded. Here's a question. Do I hate having to do what God says or am I happy about it? <laughs> do I hate having to do what God says or am I happy about it? Think about it. Boy, you, you got to make decisions. Get up in the morning. Like, oh, Lord, I got to get up. Oh, Lord, I hate this job. Oh, Lord, I hate the fact that we got to do this stay at home. Oh, Lord, I hate the fact that these children are in the house. Oh, Lord. <laughs> We're asking ourselves the question, do we hate to do what God says or are we happy about it? You know, First John chapter 5, he talks about how you know the love of God is that when we keep his commandments. And then he says, his commandments are not burdensome. We ought not see Oh, being obedient to God, it's like, oh, Lord, I got to love her again. Oh, Lord, I got to speak to him. No, 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 no. We ought to be grateful because we possess the righteousness of God. We possess the Holy Spirit. God is making a way for us each and every day, and we ought to be thankful to him that he's allowing us that privilege. It's verse 14. The law of the wisest fountain of life, to turn one away from the snares of death. The law, of the, of, of, the law of, of, of the wise is a fountain of life. Fountain of life, again, is refreshing in terms of, you know, when, when at, at the end of the day life is rough or been through a journey that, that, that the, the, the water resources are low, but at the same time I still water is there. It says, how do I look at that? Is it a fountain of life? Does it refresh me? Does it renew me? Does it rehydrate me, if you would, uh, when I'm dealing with the dryness of life? So here's the question. Do I view God's word as delightful to keep me from destruction? Yeah, the things that God is saying, it's ultimately to keep me from going down the wrong path. He might, Jesus said it. He says, he says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. Uh, 15, good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. Good understanding gains favor. Having a good understanding about things. Having a proper understanding of the word of God. Having a proper understanding of how to apply the word of God. Here's the question. Am I viewed as delightful to others or too difficult to deal with? Ask myself that question. I, you know, how am, I, how am I viewed as a delight to others? You know, do, do people like to work with me? Do like, people like to be around me? Uh, do people enjoy my company? Or am I difficult? You know, I'm always the one that, you know, got to find the wrong in everything. You know, everybody, the group trying to plan something, but I'm going to always be the one that come up with some. And everybody was looking at me like, come on, man, what are you, what are you talking about? Why you, why you always got to try to be different than everybody else? You know, because uh, understand, when you plan some group stuff, everybody don't see things the same way. But for the sake of the group being together, for the sake of but am I the person who's going to always be difficult? But do I have an understanding that I, that I am I actually a delight to others? Am I living a life where folk just tolerate me? Or do folk genuinely love me and care about me? Uh, 16, he says, every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool lays open his folly. Now, another word, again, God would, would, would have referred to a fool. No, again, keep but, but over and over, um, lays open his folly. That's, that's the opposite of righteousness. It says, every prudent man acts with knowledge, but opposite, a fool lays open his folly. Am I known for making decisions that are consistently faithful or foolish? Do I think about the decisions am I going to make? Uh, is, is God a part of my decision-making process? Do I think through what I'm trying to decide, decide to do? Do I seek the word of God? Do I pray? Do I seek godly advice? Uh, and I'm talking about especially when you're making big decisions. Or do I just kind of just run at it and, and then watch it all fall apart and then at the end of the day say, you know, I should have trusted the Lord. I should have prayed. I should have done da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. So 
he, he's talking about uh, how we go about making decisions. 17, a wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful ambassador brings help. Here's the question. As a messenger, in other words, when, I gotta, when somebody tells me something and I got to transfer what I heard from that person to somebody else, as a messenger, here's, here's where it's at. I give fake news that hurt or noble facts that help. Do I say what I was told to say? Do I say the story the same way? Or do I embellish it? Do I add to it? Do I take from it? And all of a sudden, the message that was, that I, that was given to me, uh, to hopefully, you know, to somebody to, hurt, to help that person, now I take that message and I hurt that person. Well, it's the same thing, folk. When we don't properly handle the word of God, we can be very hurtful with the word of God. We can make, we can make folk not want to do what God say. We can, we, he will chasten and scourge every son. Why? Because his motivation for the most part is based on love. And what causes him to correct us? He loves us. What causes him, let me use the word, punish us. He loves us. This is so true. The other day, the other day I called, uh, I called uh, Keith Berry. We were talking. And uh, uh, Keith again, truck driver, so he's always, you know, kind of always out on the road. So he meets a lot of people. And he said he was having a discussion with a guy who, uh, who was saying, hey, man, you know, if God is all that, you know, God's supposed to be all good and all of that, why are he letting this kind of stuff happen? He's, Keith said, hey, man. He said, wait a minute. He said, man, wait a minute. Those you know Keith, he talk kind of fast. And then when he kind of get it robbed up, Keith say, he said, he say, man, what do you say when you pray? He said, he say, the guy said, he said, our father, he said, stop right there. Stop. Just stop right there. He said, now, do, do your father who love you let you get away with anything? Do your father who love you, don't he put something on your hip every now and then? Your father who loves you, don't he spank you when you need to be spanked? Your father who loves you, don't he correct you when he needs to correct you? So don't be talking about he is our father and he, nothing, nothing uh, 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 negative can happen to us. And actually... In him correcting us is not a negative, it's actually a positive. So, so we got we to gotta, we gotta understand. We want to make sure that the message that we're given from our Father is a message that, that gives, us, gives us hope. It's a message that helps and not a message that hurts. Uh, Stefan, someone's at the door, man, if you could check them out. If you don't mind, please. Look at verse, at verse uh, uh, 18. Uh, Poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction. But he who regards the rebuke will be honored. During godly correction, kind of just dealt with that as a father, right? Do I view it as hurt by a foe or help from a friend? When you got people who love you and they're trying to correct you about something, point out something in your life that doesn't align with the will of God, and you know what they're telling you is true, do you get angry at them? Do you start to see them as an enemy? Do you, do you decide, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. You're not my friend. I don't want to have nothing. Or do you see them? As somebody who really looking out for your best interest, who somebody who really, who honestly wants to help you, man, you know, I thank God so much for Suge, man. I, I thank God for my wife because she points out some things to me sometimes. I'm not paying attention. She say, Lee, why are you doing such and such? Why you, why you say it like that? She has to remind me every now and then. Why, why you be cutting off people when, you, when they talk? I say, oh, Lord, do I do that? But I don't see her as her trying to hurt me. I see her as a friend, as someone who loves me, who's trying to help me. Because that's what righteousness does. It doesn't allow you to see someone going the wrong way and don't really, not willing to address whatever the issue may be. Uh, 19, uh, a desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is abomination to fools to depart from evil. Watch this. Do I experience joy when I please the Lord or I care less if I change? Yeah. You know, when, when, when there are certain issues that are going on in life, and I think for all of us, that ought to be a goal in our life, that there are things that we identify. You know what? I'm, 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 I'm so serious with this pandemic. Once this thing is over, I'm asking myself the question, are we going to make some changes, some godly changes that that really demonstrate that we learned something is in this pandemic or when we get out of it and we got our freedom, are we going to go back to doing some of the same old stuff we've been, we've been used to doing right now? I think we're praying more than we ever have. Are we going to keep praying right now? 
uh, watch this, we're giving as, as we ought to be giving. When we get out of this pandemic, are we going to go back to that old habit, of the way of giving that we were doing before? Uh, right now, we're on our, we, we, we know that this is the way that we're keeping our job, and we're doing our work even at home. We're doing our work as unto the Lord. When I go back to that job, am I going to go back to those old habits of, you know, being on Facebook and, and uh, doing some things that I should be doing while I'm there? No. He's reminding us, in the word of God, do I experience joy when I please the Lord? Listen, folks, you ought to be glad when you can go to the word of God and recognize that there are things that God has said in your life that need to change. And through the help of the Holy Spirit, through the power of God, you actually see yourself change. You ought to thank God for that and not be the kind of person, look, that's just who I am. This is who I'm going to be. If you don't like it, that's just tough. We're talking about being righteous or being wicked. Um, 20, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Am I influenced more by my companions who are wise or wicked? People that I hang out with, people that I talk to. Listen, listen, here's the truth. I can be a believer. I can be a believer. Uh, Paul identified that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, chapter 3. Remember chapter 2, he talked about the spiritual man. He said the spiritual man what knows the things of God. Uh, then he said, again, that same, in that same issue, the natural man cannot understand the things of God. And so he's talking about an unbeliever. But the spiritual man is the one who, who understands what the deep things of God. Then when he gets to chapter 3, he says, but you are yet carnal. You are yet carnal. Meaning this, that I can be saved, I can be a believer, but I can act and talk like somebody who don't know Jesus. Yeah, I can cuss. I can be angry. I can fuss. I can criticize everything the president does, everything the governor does, everything that Harris County judge does, everything that the mayor does, everything the mailman does, everything that the people who deliver my groceries, I, just so critical. What he's saying, righteous, or is it, is it wicked? So he's reminding us, he's reminding us in his word, who am I more influenced by? Am I influenced by the talking heads of television or am I more influenced by the word of God? Are you more influenced by what your pastor is teaching you or are you more influenced by what the politician is teaching you? Um, uh, verse 21, evil pursues sinners, but the righteous, uh, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. Here's a question. Do I sense the overall results of my life as bad that happens to sinners or good that happens to the saved? That's what I mean by that. You know, do anytime something happens, do I look at it like, oh, man, you know, God is, you know, I don't know why God is doing this to me and why God is. No. Or do I look at it as my father who is in heaven is developing me. My father who is in heaven who is, 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 is helping me to grow. You remember when Job was going through what he was going through and his wife said, hey, baby, you ought to curse God and die. He looked at it and said, babe, you talk like a foolish woman. Are we to expect only good and not adversity? No, but don't look at it when you're going through a tough time. Don't look at it as though your heavenly father is treating you bad. See that he's working it out for your, for your good. Uh, verse 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children, children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Am I planning for a prosperous future or not particularly, or, or not particularly, uh, not particular, I'm sorry, about who gets what? Am I planning for a prosperous future or not particular about who gets what? In other words, however it turned out, that's just the way it turned out. Or am I making plans right now? You know, as an adult, you know, uh, uh, we, we, uh, uh, it's clear to us that God says that we ought to be leaving something for our children's children. That's what the scripture says, right? So, but, but am I living my life in such a way that I got to have everything I want right now, you know, and the heck with what my children are going to get in the future? Or the heck with what my grandchildren are going to get in the future? Can, can I buy, can I buy, um, uh, four less suits or dresses in the year, save that money for a prosperous future, or, or do I have to have what I want and I have to have it right now? 
do I have to have that particular vehicle? Do I have to have that truck? Do I have to have that car? Do I have to have those pairs of shoes? Or is there an alternative? Is there something that I could do that could cause me to save for the future? I'm about done. Bear with me. I thank you all so much. Um, 23. Much food is in the fallow ground of the poor. And for lack of justice, there is, there is waste. Am I truly concerned or could care less about the injustice toward those, uh, toward, the, toward the less fortunate? Am I truly concerned or could care less about the injustice toward the less fortunate? Look, it's not happening to me. Tough luck. Hey, just, you know, things happen. But do I care about that? Do I care enough to do something about it? Do I, do I care enough to, uh, to get involved to where maybe there are laws that I can help to change or uh, to pray for that family, to pray for that individual, whatever it is I can do. Uh, am I concerned about the injustice uh, that takes place for those who are lacking? Uh, 24, he who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Am I abusively lenient or adamantly loving in the godly discipline of my children? Am I truly, I'm sorry, am I abusively lenient? Do I just let my children, hey, you know, I'm going to get you. You better stop that. You better, st don't, don't do that. Or, and somebody want to correct them. I say, hey, you know, hey, hey, that's my child. That's my child. You leave my child alone. No. Or do I correct children immediately? Look, I keep saying it. Our children are either younger, younger, younger or smaller versions of us. That's who they are. So the Bible is clearly teaching us he who spares the rod. And when he talk about spare the rod, I mean, I know folk look at it and just beat it. They ain't talking about beating children all the time. That doesn't make sense because at some point you get used to the beating. What he is saying, that's a way to correct. What, how do we do that? According to discipline, we teach, we talk, we test. 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 After we teach, talk, test, and it doesn't appear that it's catching on, then we tap. Yeah, that's what, that, but it's in the word. But I know some of people are saying, hey, put them in time out, leave them alone, tell them not to do that. Let's try what the word of God says, because if we do it early, we won't have to do it later. That's what the word of God says. Here's the last one. Thank y'all for bearing with us. The righteous eats to the satisfying of his soul, but the stomach of the wicked shall be in want. Is my soul internally content or am I externally craving more stuff? Is my soul uh, internally content? Listen, you know, we're going through this issue with the pandemic. We, oh, man, and it's, it's, some, it's, some, it's, some, it's some strange things. Reverend Fagg used to say that years ago. Strange things are happening every day. But, oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. Uh, we got to take everything that we got to, what, to God in prayer. So, but the question is, Am I content? Am I learning to be content? Have I learned in these last two months that I can't, I can't make life change, but can I, I can adjust to life as it is and allow God to change me for whatever that situation may be? Paul said it in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He said, man, I learned to be content whatever state I'm in. So I can't, I can't come to church like I want to come to church, but I'm going to be content. I'm going to be content with the Bible study by live stream. I'm going to be content with the sermon by live stream. I'm going to be content with whatever God is allowing me to experience at that particular time, knowing that if I still do those things that God is saying to, for me to be obedient in, even in the situation that I'm in, I got a God who can either turn me for it or can turn it around. Either what? Either situation. He's going to change me for the situation or he's going to change the situation. But I got to trust him. And learn to be content. Settle down. That's what the Proverbs are teaching us. I mean, matters of daily life, matters of daily decision. How do we respond to life when it comes without the expectation that life is always going to come to us the way we think it should? When things are not ideal, when things are not as I would like them to be, am I utilizing the word of God? to respond to whatever that situation may be. I want to encourage us today, either determine that I'm going to do it the righteous way or I'm going to do it the wicked way because there's only two ways that God would have me to do it. Even as a believer, 
I can make those good choices. I can make those wrong choices. Pastor Alvin Lafleur preached a sermon many, many years ago. Still to this day, I can't remember the text, but the subject was so profound. It still impresses my heart today, and I think he must have preached that sermon um, late 70s, early 80s, somewhere in that area. And the subject was, life is shaped by choices. And that's what uh, Solomon teaches, that our lives are shaped by the choices we make. Listen, my prayer is that God continue to bless and keep uh, all of us. Uh, would you all do this for me before we, before we get off the air? I need, to, I need you to write these numbers for me. Uh, we got another f- a conference call that we're going to be utilizing. So write it down and then get the word to everybody else. Here's the number, 605-313-5488, 605-313-5488. That's the new conference call number. Here's the access code, 889-555, access code 889-555. Here's another number I want you to add to it. It's called a playback number, 605-313-4108. I'm going to do the numbers again. Conference call number 605 313 5488. Access code 889 555. Playback number, write that down 605 313 4104. Let's keep Sister Helen Marie Freeman and her family in our prayers. Let's continue to pray for Sister Betty Savannah, Sister Carolyn Ben, uh, who are in the nursing homes. Family can't see them. Let's continue loving each other. You got the prayer concerns on a, on a weekly basis. Let's keep praying for one another. Lord willing, we'll see each other again, or I will see you all. You all will see me on Sunday. In the meantime, let's stay in touch with one another. Call somebody that you had not called yet in these last eight weeks, nine weeks that you, we've been in this pandemic. Let them know you love them. Let them know you're concerned about them. Father, how we thank you again for this opportunity to be able to present your word so that we will know how to live a godly life in a way that's pleasing to you. We ask again that you continue to keep us in your perfect peace with our minds always stayed on you, that everything that we do is for your glory. And as a result, we are able to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you in advance for all you are and all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Until we meet again, God bless you. I love you all.